Hey everybody, Bridget Lynn Dolgoff, Conscious of Economics and Urban Farm Project. Anyway, this is my fruit lane, <laughs> my fruit tree, so you guys get to, and my blooming begonia, and then also in the very back, lemongrass. So these trees were a quarter of their size when I got them uh, in fall. Yeah, so they're doing good. Okay, so I kind of want to talk about something that is, is kind of crazy. So there's, there's two parts. The first part is that when you're going to sail off or sail up or you're kind of, I don't know, um, I don't really like the word manifesting your reality, but, or statement, um, but when you've done all the work and you're ready to take that step up in a, in a victory, you know, maybe even like a small or big victory lap, <clears throat> the matrix, you know, will agent Smith you. And you have to allow, usually it's, you know, as you clear up your life, there's less and less of these agent Smith moments. That's what I really like about Don Juan and the work of Carlo Castaneda is that um, it's a platform for kind of understanding this reality um, and the kind of things that you need to do and practice to kind of clean your life up, recapitulate your life so that way you kind of cease happenings um, that are happening out of your control and your life has so much impeccability that there is no way for Agent Smith to infringe. Um, and pop little things in. So today I got a, I got one popped in. And I think it's interesting because recently um, I was rereading one of Carlo Castaneda's books. And Don Juan was talking about how you know, kind of more of the stressful moments in our life are kind of the ones that are the best um, to learn from. And it's where the rabbits pop out of the hat, you know, basically the magic hat, what's in the magic hat. And you have those moments where the rabbit pops out, which is the information, the truth, the knowledge, so that you can get past that situation. And in these Rabbits popping out of the hat could be all kinds of different stuff. Um, and just witness to see what is playing out instead of reacting to it. So this is one of those cases. So I had a friend and on my YouTube channel, Jonathan Button, um, he uh, passed away a couple years ago. Uh, but I did an interview with him on my radio show about his journey as kind of a yoga person who started out with like Yogi Bijan um, in, you know, um, New Mexico and then following some of the people to, or, you know, moving into San Diego and then there's the group that was there. <clears throat> and during his life, you know, he ended up kind of um, dabbling in some things and I think it's kind of the nature of rabbit holes and there's another story I'd like to tell everybody but I'm not going to have time for that today but still kind of you know stewing on it so anyway so Jonathan before you know um, after he had like this major major stroke he was down in New Mexico so I went down there and it, it was during Yogi Bijan's tenure um, death anniversary and Yogi Bijan's like birthday. So it was like kind of a big celebration, a lot of Sikh Kundalini, you know, stuff. It, in America, it's the heart of that stuff. So <clears throat> he was down there, he had a stroke, he decided to go back to kind of his basics. He was like in his 60s. And then he ended up um, well, he started having some small strokes and all kinds of different stuff. And so I went through there for about two weeks. <clears throat> to help him, I've known him since like 2006, um, kind of in a heavy spiritual way. <clears throat> there was a point um, a 
after he got back from New Mexico and he was in San Diego, I went to go see him and um, I just started to help him. I stayed there about a month with him and helped him with different things and helped him with his diet and um, trying to get his brain to work better and just different types of exercise, a lot of pool therapy. Um, and then he decided he was going to move down to this hot springs full time, which was the best thing that he ever did. Um, so <clears throat> in the course of this, going back to San Diego, I have a lot of friends that I don't live close to that, you know, I have these circles with these looping arounds with where wherever they're at, I'll go visit if I have time. And sometimes I stay for a while. I help them, you know, heal um, <clears throat> and get to see other places and, you know, have a little bit of a vacation for myself and, you know, my traveling um, healing practice, I guess. Um, so before he went down to the hot springs, we kind of went through a lot of stuff that he had. And during, and I'll post the video, look for the video on my YouTube channel. I think it's like a real vampire experience. Um, something like that is the title of the video. It's worth listening to because I lived it and he lived it. He was involved in it. So he was kind of leaning towards not a pull towards darkness and, but it kind of started, we figured out with this painting and he was given these, these, um, old Japanese like deity paintings when he was, uh, I think living with his parents in Japan or something like that. Cause his, his dad was like a diplomat, but they were like deity. And I believe that this is kind of like why he got into all the other stuff that he was getting into because of the open energy fields of these types of paintings. And one of them actually had like four people on it who chopped the head off of this main person. There's like blood and stuff. And <clears throat> we realized like going through his timeline of stuff, you know, like where is the darkness hidden? You know, where's the propensity for um, those things to kind of, um, you know, Don Juan would have called them a, a foreign installation in our mind. And all they need is just a little bit of us not paying attention. So we realized that when he, right before, a couple of years, a year or two after he got that painting, he had this really bad accident where he dove in, I believe, into like a lake or river and thought it was way deeper and broke his neck. And it was pretty serious. And I feel like the neck break um, though we worked on it, you know, we were a big halo, you know, all that when he was younger. And then he ended up going to New Mexico and studying with Yogi Bijan there. And just, you know, all the other stuff, you know, that went through his life. Then he started collecting things from thrift stores. And he um, collected the two peace staffs, native traditional peace staffs that somebody probably had stolen and they had sold an antique store and he was using them kind of, he used to like dress up in these costumes and stuff. So, um, as a shocker, you know, kind of to the public anyway. So I had to get those two and, um, I call them the coyote brothers and I've been, um, taking care of them, um, until, um, the release ceremony. So I don't know, you know, I've had them for a while, but I keep them happy and safe. And, um, and they are, you know, power, they have power, not bad power at all, but good power. But they, <clears throat> you know, to a regular person who has a doorway that's partially open through um, a painting that they have in their picture that they have in their possession since, you know, years, it could, you know, lots of different things have different platforms and big different attorneys or different attorneys, you know, like alters and medicine ways of how things are. And so that's why like in a lot of the native tradition, you don't, you can't really mix energy medicines. You either work with this one for a while or you work with this one 
but you cannot intermix medicines like for example marijuana and peyote Woo, not good um they are very conflictive beings and they can cause some serious trouble that's why if you're going to do dreamy medicines you really need to like detox for a long time you need to clean up your diet um, you need to do a lot of um, quiet contemplation, getting yourself prepared three weeks to three months before and then after coming out of it, you got like a three week to three month period of doing that kind of same thing, right? So anyway, so we end up giving, so we ended up going through all of his stuff so that he could make this trip to move to this hot springs in this older RV that he had. Um, and just, you know, be able to do pull therapy and stuff. That's stuff that I've been teaching him to do. Um, and he was going to work 100% on himself, which is like, this is exactly what he needed. Mind you, the crazy vampire events and all the energy stuff really kind of destroyed his son. His son, after they got back to San Diego, his son actually fell off like a 200-foot cliff onto the sand at the bottom where the ocean comes in into San Diego, like broke his, broke himself up pretty bad. Um, I have no idea how his son is doing now, but his son was down with him in New Mexico. And I think that all of it was just, um, yeah, he wasn't prepared for those kinds of experiences. All right. So anyway, so what happened with this, there was, this particular painting with the beheading on it. So we kind of decide to, he had this realization that, that on his timeline that this painting probably, he was probably, I mean, he probably shouldn't have survived that accident, right? Because in the painting, I mean, they behead the person and it, they're dead. The deity's dead with the blood coming down, sacrifice. And so, but because, you know, of his, I think, spiritual strength, and he was pretty tenacious, he survived it. And this, I don't know how old he was, young, young, young. Um, and so he realizes, like, he has kind of a realization, like, some of the stuff that he's been keeping has, you know, disasterly harmed or had the propensity to cause harm. I mean, even if we didn't have, like, full-on proof, but just because everything lined up, um, the events, timeline events. So we make the decision to send the painting to a man who is a exorcist, but also he has like a compound where he, um, he collects these haunted items to protect people from them. And some of them are like encased with like salt, you know, in separate vaults, like, you know, some, some of them, they all have different kinds of danger levels. But the bottom line is that we couldn't have this painting hurting other people. And because of his conscience, he didn't want to have to give it to other people that it may harm them. So we end up packaging it up and sending some stuff to the exorcist vault guy so that it can be um, protected uh, from the public. And, you know, people can get stuff like that aren't so good and use it against other people. They, you know, a lot of different things can happen. And once you kind of get a hold of some of these things, you know, they're generational. They get a hold, you know, all the way through. So anyway, so we send it all off. He got prepared. Um, I took some of the native medicine stuff that he had. Um, I brought that stuff home. It was a crazy journey getting that stuff home. That's a whole other topic. Um, and the, the Coyote brothers are in care, and they're happy, and they're peaceful, and um, they're not being charged up, and they're not being charged down. And so now, today, here's where evil comes in, like the beginning of this conversation where um, Agent Smith comes in. So today is like a day where I'm taking a super victory lap. It's going to be a little bit stressful 
just a lot of things um, that I've wanted to create and like um, a co-op and just all this other stuff. And today is our third event and just a lot of stuff that I can't really like, you know, go into. But I <laughs> his daughter is kind of a nut job. You know, she really only cares kind of about money. So when he passed, um, there wasn't anything, right? Um, there was a few things there. One of the Japanese paintings was okay. It didn't really have any problems attached to it. So that was left um, in his stuff, you know, that she probably got. Well, it's been like two years, okay? Two years since he died. Two years since I tried to communicate with her about some of the, you know, events that had happened to him and his brother, her brother. Um, and also a radio interview that I did with Jonathan from when I was doing radio. Um, but she didn't really pay attention to it. And, and so all of a sudden, I get this message on Facebook Messenger, like, can I ask you something? And she just goes on and on and on. And she goes, well, I'm dealing with this art dealer. And, um, where's these other paintings? You know, because he had taken pictures of them and they had been on his Facebook page. And she wanted to know, like, where what happened to them and where they went and all this other stuff. Well, anyway, all paths, you know, kind of lead to me. And I just had a conversation with her this morning. So it was like the first thing that I saw and the first conversation I had. And it got me kind of jacked up. And she wants to get these paintings back so she can sell them because, you know, her dad didn't leave any money. And I was like, um, I'm not going to help you to recover, you know, these pieces of artwork because your dad sent them. Right. He packaged them up and he sent them to this person to be protected away from people. OK, that was what he did. Not me, him. I helped him because he's, you know, um, he's had several strokes. Um, but he made no money off of it. Nobody made any money. And these went into a vault in the safety and care so they're not used to harm people. Um, so I'm getting this email and she wants to know where they're at and how she can contact this guy because she really wants to sell them to make money. And I'm trying to explain to her that, you know, they're haunted and they're cursed. And um, if you sold these ki this kind of a thing to somebody, you would do them like great harm, like so it was the conversation with her was so crazy. And then I thought, well, maybe these things of they're trying to get back in or she's obsessing about it to get her hands on it, which is not going to be good for her because it's embedded in generation. It's already destroyed. The dad has nothing lo longer to feed off of. The brother is pretty effed up, not a lot to feed off there. So now, you know, it's trying to get her to bring it back to her. So it can have a, you know, stronger connection to her and destroy her life. But, you know, people just don't really seem to get this kind of stuff. And I suspect she's heavily in debt. I think they were buying houses for rentals and um, whatever else. But it's like the craziest story. And it just shocked me. And it was like throwing me off. And I'm like, today is going to be a, a victory day at the co-op. And you know what? There could be some Agent Smith stuff coming out. There could be some rabbits popping out of the hat today, which is okay. They need to pop out in order for me to know, you know, what hasn't been dealt with, you know, my own, you know, inner demon, so to speak. And, you know, that jiggy other people, trigger other people. So I just thought it was so crazy to be having this conversation with her today on Facebook. And ultimately, I just said, you know, I can't really talk to you anymore. Like, this is super, this conversation is so crazy and you know she's just trying to manipulate me to get what she wants so i blocked her i should have blocked her a long time ago but i didn't because i left the door open for her and i to maybe get to know each other to discuss some things that she may have wanted to know about her dad that may affect her family you know in the long term um, and why this goes on and why that is happening but anyway uh, look for the video, a uh, real vampire, I think, story. Um, and that's connected to the person that I was talking about today. And um, yeah, all right. That's it. Talk to you later, everybody. Have a nice day. Great day. Bye-bye.